And we're here today with Jose Wilson, who's a New York City public schools math teacher and the founder of EduColor, a community of teacher activists working for a more just future in education. Um, Jose Wilson, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, Jose, I feel like we probably grew up at like similar times or similar ages because as I read your stuff, there are these sort of like late 80s, early 90s rap lyrics that are kind of woven throughout. Um, and so um, I'm feeling like you're somewhere around, you know, 40, 42 um, growing up in the in the 80s and 90s. Do I have you pegged right or were you uh, listening to that music real young? <laughs> I mean, I, I grew up in similar uh, spaces to those who we listen to. So there is that as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm a, older, um, I'm a much older soul though. So <laughs> there's that. Cause you grew up right in New York city. I did. Um, and how far, how far away from your current school did you grow up? Um, I mean, it's still the same borough, but the lower East side is like diagonally the opposite side of, uh, where I teach now, which is Inwood Washington Heights. So um, it's it, it's different and the same at the same time. Yeah, which is, I think, a very New York City phenomenon that small geographic distances can be large cultural or large, uh, um, you know, you can you can move a very small difference in the very small distance in the city and be in a very different kind of place. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, um, you have made not only teaching your career, but advocacy for teachers your career. Um, I think just this past week you were speaking to the Congressional Black Caucus. You're the co-founder of uh, EduColor. Um, what, what got you into teacher advocacy and what sustains you in that work? Gosh, I mean, there's any number of different branches that could go into with that. I think um, when it comes to my advocacy work, I think it's an extension of any number of things that I saw, whether it be um, the influx of of activism that happened um, in the 60s and 70s, as per you know the the young lords and um, being around, I guess the New York and like that that element was so present in the Lower East Side. And then um, growing up, especially I would say in college, like finding finally some texts and experiences that mirrored mine, and finally I getting and accumulating any number of languages that speak to my experience in this country uh, really allowed me to become an activist. And actually, activism was probably the lens by which um, I started teaching because um, when I was the uh, ed education chair, which at the time was really like the president of the Latino organization on campus at Syracuse University, um, I was doing any number of teachings and workshops. So I was already kind of priming for teaching, even though I didn't even know I was going to be a teacher uh, really um, until a little later on. Um, I, I think something to, there's something to be said for having a teacher who already has a sociopolitical mindset around um, how the work ought to go. So uh, akin to what you see with Geneva Gay's work, Gloria Latson Billings, folks like that who say that it's not enough to just be culturally competent and academically have high expectations, but it's good for us to have a, a sociopolitical uh, orientation around assuring that children have high expectations and that they are, um, I guess, well-rounded in the academics that they have. So like all of it is interconnected in that way. Um, and so for me, coming into this profession, I found myself wanting to, to be a teacher and wanting to do it more than the couple of years that uh, I was mandated to do so um, as for my contract with the NYC Teaching Fellows. And then EduColor really came about because I started for, I guess, I, guess I, I would call it luck, but I mean, a lot of it is really hard work through the blogging that I did and being one of the few uh, education bloggers at the time who was intersecting politics, race, and um, education, I, I, everybody just started saying, okay, this is a voice that we can try to help. And when I got into all these rooms, I noticed that uh, some of these issues weren't really coming to the fore when it came to race, especially from a perspective of a person of color, especially from a black man, such as myself. EduColor came through that. And it wasn't, you know, this, this is... I wouldn't say it's divorced from, I think it's because it came from knowing that, you know, there's a left, quote unquote, and there's a right in this country, but then there's like any number of different lanes where people are like, yeah, but you're, you need to start talking about this race issue even before it became hot, even before Black Lives Matter became this thing. Um, and, and well, in it's fact, still a before, thing, so. but, you know, but before, um, 
Black like that, or, or certainly in, you know, if you were looking at education, blogging, education online discourse 10 or 15 years ago, people who brought political perspectives into discussions of math, into discussions of history teaching, into discussions of and say, wait, whoa, 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 you know, I want to follow these people because I want to hear about better math teaching. What does politics have to do with this? Um, what does race have to do with this? Um, I mean, it's more common now. Um, and certainly it's still, it's certainly still the case that, that people will push back on um, wanting to hear, ab- you know, about the intersection between, you know, the sort of uh, rigorous academic instruction and, you know, social justice and structural change. Um, but, uh, yeah, hard work to do 10 or 15 years ago. So so what is edu- what do you feel like EduColor is working towards now? Um, what is What are the kinds of conversations that you're hoping to be having with other educators online? Or, or what are the kinds of conversations you're hoping to be fostering? Well, for me, I really feel like, and you mentioned this too, is like, it's not that EduColor is the first to do it. You know, any number of people, you know, we kind of, we consider ourselves a transcendent sort of organization where we're trying to learn from the histories of people who had been teaching since the very first time that somebody taught somebody else how to read in spite of laws uh, uh, allow, not allowing the enslaved to actually read. Like, that's how deep we're thinking about this work and uh, what it looks like in the 21st century. So for me, I feel like, you know, we're trying to get to a point where we have a kind concrete, solidified organization um, that is that will actually be a home to that movement. So, I, you know, the EduColor movement, thankfully, has just done the work. Like, it's been out there in a really positive way. And there's any number of organizations now that uh, aspire to that EduColor type of work. Um, and I'm glad to have coined that term specifically for that work. <laughs> um, and then there's, like, the actual organization where it's like, oh, well, we probably need to solidify this because... Um, if there is a history written about it, we ought to be included in the work that we actually did in the 21st century and find ways to encapsulate that for generations forthcoming. And what, and what, in your view, sort of what should those generations forthcoming be talking about? Like, what are the conversations that, that teachers aren't having enough of now? Or what are the, um, what, you know, what are the ways that we, that, that you're hoping to push people's thinking? Wow. I mean, there's any number of things. I think it has to, it starts with uh, what does it look like for an educator of color to come into a space um, that is often resistant to that person's being in that system? I don't think it's any one person. I think it's any number of systemic issues. And every time that we make lists about why teachers leave, for example, we have to look at some of these other lists like, um, why is it that teachers of color are leaving or why is it that teachers of color are staying? So uh, any number of these like little like matrices that we're not analyzing and not publicizing well, we need to start really looking at because I don't think that's going to be a problem that we solve in the next like 10 years even until we really get a good discussion going on around it and then a set of policies that um, allow for that conversation to happen. So for example, um, there's been conversations around why teachers of color like leave even though they're coming in at the fastest rates that's ever been recorded. Uh, I guess I, what I would say is um, education reform in the last 10 to 12 years um, has made it difficult for teachers of color to stay because we're often in the spaces that get shut down, taken over, or like, um, I guess, charterized, if you will, privatized, if you will. I mean, there's any number of things that happen to, to schools that are... Um, serving children of color, especially black children, in a way that does not happen to schools that predominantly serve white children in this country. And not to say that um, it's a perfect thing, it's not 100%, but it is more likely that that happens. And those are systemic issues that we do need to find a way to resolve, especially as the students of color are now the majority in (laughs) in the student population for public schools, whereas that's not happening with the staff of color. And so you described um, uh, particular reasons why teachers of color leave and particular reasons why teachers of color stay. So one of the things you described is that if teachers of color are predominantly serving the most vulnerable students, um, then they're going to be working in schools that are going to be most likely to be targeted by the system, be to be closed and those kinds of things. What, what are the other sort of special burdens or special opportunities or special joys that teachers of color have um, in working in their schools and working in their classrooms um, that perhaps white teachers wouldn't be as conscious of as they're making these kinds of lists? 
I, you know what I've no, there's two things because there's obviously like any number of joys that I get even when I'm going through a day like today where it's like I mid like I <laughs> I just finished class so of course I'm thinking about all the kids and all the things that are going on today but um, I would say the first thing is that if you pick up on what um, Lisa Delpit had talked about in other people's children you'll notice that the person who is of color in that book and when she first starts the book is trying to build relationships with students. And now that relationships are in vogue, it kind of feels weird because it's a practice that I feel like so many communities had already been talking about for decades, if not centuries, that you know we want to learn from people we trust. Um, right. That's a special joy for us because so many of us actually grew up in neighborhoods like the ones that we serve. If not, we are already learning in the spaces that we serve. So like some of the teachers who are in this building have actually learned at this school. They're graduates of the school and then they went to this, uh, the high schools that the kids may be going to um, and aspire to. Same thing with the colleges, right? Like th Those are special joys to be contributing to the legacy of educational experiences for our kids. Um, I think secondly, there's something to be said for um, even knowing that you have found a way to contribute back to the communities from which you came. Being able to say, hey, like... Um, I, I believe I can do it. I believe you can do it. And then having somebody who like not only believes it is an example of it. Like that mirror effect is so critical. So I mean, those are two big things. And not to and again, because it always comes up. Oh, but white teachers this, white teachers that. I'm like, yeah, but white teachers can learn from us. White mm -hmm. white teachers can learn how to build those relationships because we've already gone through it. And as adults, we now have the language to be able to translate in the best ways possible why our pedagogies work as they work when they do work. Um, you talked about building relationships with your students. I was thinking that, uh, you know, so it's mid-September right now as we're having this conversation. Um, you're probably two or three weeks into school. Just about, um, yeah, eight days. You know, so, so, so we're a little bit past the sort of first day kind of get to know you activities, but on a, on a day like today, when you're a couple weeks in where the routine is starting to get settled in your classroom, what does building relationships look like on a, on, on a kind of daily day-to-day -day basis to you? Like what were kinds of, what were some of the practices that were happening in your classroom today that were meant to reinforce those relationships that were meant to sort of continue the work of getting to know your students, getting them to know you? You would be surprised at how many kids think that teachers shouldn't know their names by now. Mm. Um, so when I call roll, people are like, oh, well, that's that, that's that student. That's, that's. I'm like, yes, I know the students already. I know your name. So you don't have to. And then they kind of just sit back like, um, so this person knows my name already. Naming things is a really critical element to all this, right? Um, secondly, doing my walk around, not necessarily standing at the board, actually walking around and teaching from the back, teaching from the side, uh, trying to like whisper into students and say, hey, like, um, I like how you did this. Oh, have you considered this? Um, and then I guess the way that I scaffold questions, that doesn't show up on a lesson plan. At this point, I feel like there are some things that aren't going to show up and they're kind of like, make, they make me agile. But mm -hmm. I'm, it's also about me building that academic rapport with the students. So if I look at a student's work and I'm like, oh, well, um, I, I like what you did there. Have you considered this? Or um, yes, that's great. And like I may affirm them a little bit and then I'll ask them to share in front of class. And I'll see like, oh, this conversation that I had with this student, look at the evidence that, you know, that, that we came up with. So a conversation that I may have with a student may have been so enlightening. I may ask the student to actually share the conversation that me and him, he, me and him, he, me and them, we actually had. So that's a critical element to all that. Um, and you could build that academic relationship just by doing those sorts of things. Not to mention like the other types of things too, like having the understanding of where they come from and then being able to pick up on those social cues and say, okay, I'm gonna reply to you in a way that you didn't expect from a teacher to do, but very much what you would expect from someone from your neighborhood to do so and um sometimes it works sometimes it's like you're kind of old mr billson and i'm like all right, all right i'll let that rock for now or, or i'll just make it, was, it uncool and then they'll just stop using it so you just it was pretty cool in the 90s i promise you um <laughs> 
So, so one th- one description that I like there in the first couple of weeks is I, I sort of envision you saying, okay, you know, I've got 47 minutes or 52 minutes or however many minutes your period is. And I'm going to make sure that in that 47 minutes during this first week that like I'm looking over the shoulder of each one of the kids in this classroom and I'm trying to make like one personal connection per period for each kid when I've got some of those kids who seem like they're sort of less drawn right away. Like those are the kids who I'm going to find, you know, catch them in the act of doing something right, like grab one of those things that's like sort of a really special piece of thinking, maybe something they wouldn't have recognized as a special piece of thinking um, and be like, well, we're going to highlight this in front of everyone. We're going to pause class for a little bit so that we can all celebrate, um, you know, what this student has done. And then that starts to build uh, that academic rapport. You said something about scaffolding questions and that um, in, uh, piqued my interest. Um, as you're thinking about the ways that you talk to kids, that you ask questions, like what are some of the sort of specific strategies that you turn to um, to to build rapport, to get them thinking mathematically, to get them thinking of themselves as mathematicians? So the whole point of me asking questions, and this, this is kind of like backwards thinking, but uh, kind of try to follow me here is, I'm trying to get it to the point where I cede as much power as possible. I'm trying to let go of it. And so if my questions at any moment are doing like the step-by-step thing, then that that means that that's kind of at a lower rung for me as far as I'm concerned. Versus if I can ask some elevating questions, I'm getting where I want to be. And then those higher order questions um, kind of come from a place of saying, okay, so I have a feeling you've mastered this, and I'm gonna see if you actually did. Uh, so that's kind of that's like my three tiers as I'm playing with my mind. So then, in the middle of class, like I'll say, okay, I know I'm supposed to model this for you, but before I do that, does anyone notice anything? Okay, so they'll notice something. So um, how could we build on this? And you know, that, that it's kind of like a slow build. And then um, even as I'm modeling, I'm kind of thinking aloud for them about what questions I might ask about what's in front of me. And then there's a point where like, I'm, I'm pretty confident that they don't know that thing that they're supposed to know. So for instance, if it's like a unit on, and I'm looking at it on the board right now, so don't mind my yeah, eyes. Yeah. Tell is, us what um, you did today. <laughs> and if I'm doing a... a, a a uh, lesson on reducing fractions, for example, right? And I know they haven't used the words relatively prime, for instance. That's when I may interject with that direct teaching and actually like sum up the thoughts that people had conjured as we had the discussion. But that happens after maybe five or six minutes, right? And then I may go back and then say, okay, let me do that process again. And then they'll pick up on the questions. And then that's when they start responding in the way that they ought to. And then I leave them be. Like that's where that's where the questions come from more than anything. It's kind of hard to like give you the set of questions that I'm always going through because it's not just like no, but that was great. You got you got three tiers of questions there. Yeah. There's ones that are sort of guiding people step by step. There are ones that are sort of like surfacing people's opinions and seeing what they're noticing, and then the third where you're sort of seeing like can I ask them the question that sort of gets them to put it all together, um, you know, maybe in a way that we haven't gotten there. And so the question, as I think of that sort of triad, the question that you just described, like what do people notice? what you're seeing here is a sort of one of those, those second tier questions that kind of, okay, I'm going to um, let you tell me what you're noticing, what you're observing. And there's probably some cases where you're like, hey, I think you all have figured out something here um, and I can give you the mathematician's name for it. Um, or there may be some things like today where it's like, you know what, I'm pretty sure you all don't get relatively prime. Um, and instead of having us try to derive that from first principles, let me give you that. Like, that's why I'm here um, to share some of that. But you got, you got as close as we could get in the time we had to relatively prime. And some people might say, you know, well, Mr. Wilson, like, why not just tell them from the beginning of the lesson what relatively the prime is? And you're saying, no, 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 because we're not just here to, because, because part of like, like a meaningful relationship and ultimately a more efficient classroom is when those kids feel like they have a voice, where they feel like they have a chance to sort of explore the mysteries of math, um, not just as, you know, and part of it, of course, is as received from above, but part of it is like, no, we can discuss cover this like you're I mean what's great about that question what do you notice is like we all have intuitions um, anyone can see some things and start putting patterns together um, and start building that kind of mathematical noticing um, uh, are there are there other questions or other moves that you were using today as you reflect back on your day that you think you know what these these are the kinds of things I wasn't doing five or six years ago or ten years ago when I just started but they've become more sort of central to my practice now as I've as I've grown um, into your teaching 
Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, we re- recently got introduced to some co mo- co teaching, uh, I guess frameworks, if you will, and I'm doing that with a newer teacher. So we were kind of struggling in the beginning as to what our routine was going to be, and then I finally said, you know what? All right, so. I think it's just best for me to take the lead because you're relatively new, but you're going to deliver whatever lesson it is. But in turn, I'm also going to be that person that assists the kids wherever there I see any gaps. So there was a point where we were subtracting and adding, uh, dig- I guess, uh, decimal numbers. And so um, the students were generally focused on the newer teacher and they were looking directly at him. But then um, I'm telling the new teacher like on the lesson plan to go ahead and like ask the students step by step how you actually subtract or add uh, those numbers. And then as he's asking on the right side of the board, I'm actually writing down the steps that they actually saying out loud. So in that way, we were able to co-teach. And then once they finished our problem, when I moved away, they noticed that there was a list of five steps for them to do. So for the kids who knew what they were doing, then they don't didn't have to worry as much about that. But the kids who were kind of lost as to how their approach was, they had a list right there on the right-hand side. So we were both on the board. It just so happened that... Um, as I'm on the board, they're not paying attention to me because, I mean, yes, I'm, I'm big, but <laughs> I can be kind of quiet <laughs> while the teacher who's supposed to be teaching at the moment does what he's supposed to be doing. So I, I found that to be a pretty powerful instructional move. And then, you know, once we start the classwork, then I can kind of whip around and say, hey, did you notice what we just wrote over there? Uh, let's take that step by step. What does that look like? Versus the kids who kind of already got it, then they don't have to worry as much. So um, that that's I found that pretty powerful today. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And and co-teaching is something that's sort of new for you this year. It is new. I mean, usually every the year, co-te- man. This I'm sorry, something, something new to learn, something new to build on, some new way to grow. I mean, that's exciting. It has to be because in previous times, the co-teacher was usually just kind of hanging out in the back. I mean, I'll just be frank, whatever, like because I'm the math teacher, like I'm supposed to know the math. And the teacher who's in the back is usually like a teacher who's labeled the special ed teacher. Right. And then they go around and they kind of help kids where who are labeled, et cetera, et cetera. But this year I was just like, no, I mean, we have to do something better because a we're both professionals. But then B, um, we can affect more kids if more adults are interacting with every single child instead of just trying to find the labels for the kids, whoever, right? Because those labels, for me, have often meant nothing except everybody has a special need. And some people get papers for it, some people don't. Like, that's as that's helped me out tremendously as far as my, my mindset when I'm walking around the classroom. Yep, is being attentive to how, yeah, every, every, all of us, you know, on any given day have different kinds of um, learning requirements, have different, you know, you, you're like, you come in today hungry, you come in today mad, like those are deficits too. Um, and figuring out what each kid needs to thrive that day is, you know, one of the great challenges of teaching. Um, as, as new teachers are coming into your building, coming into your district, as teachers who are coming in um, that don't bring the same neighborhood familiarity, that don't bring the same cultural competence that you bring, like what kinds of things do you, would, if you get the chance, do you or would you ask them to work on? Like what, to, for, pe- for people who are coming into a new neighborhood, um, trying to, you know, relate to students, but not having the same set of resources that you have, you know, being from just a few miles away, being from the same borough, um, what advice do you give to them? You know, it's the easy thing is to say, oh, like go to the corner store and hang out. Just take a whiff of what it feels like to be that child. Um, and the, the second easiest thing is to actually ask the kids, like go ahead and mm. ask them. And sometimes they're not going to do it in the very polite and kind ways that, uh, I guess, there's like that nomenclature. Oh, well, you know, but you have to have that accountable talk. Sometimes accountable talk in, in the hood just means we're just going to make sure you're telling the truth about our experiences. <laughs> and it's not always going to come out as, as nicely as you want, but at least it's honest. Um, I think for me, too, what I found real nice is like being able to just sit there and listen not just to the people who you consider like 
at the teacher or the principal, but also the custodians, the guidance counselors, the school staff, the para the professionals, um, the lunch folks, whoever it is that you feel like you have access to, those dialogues can be really powerful. I th- you know, but for me, I'm fortunate because I did grow up in the same neighborhood. So for me, it was just very much like, okay, so you're from this background, great. Like I have a similar background. Let's talk about what that looks like. What do you eat? Where do you hang out? And then you know. Lo- Lo and behold, they just start revealing. Like they become super honest very quickly. Um, somebody who's coming from a different background, though, I think there's something to be said for just being your most authentic self, not trying to like uh, take too much of whatever the culture is. Like I come in with my own set of cultures, and whatever I can learn from you, that'd be great. But then, wherever you feel like I can step back, that'd be fine too. Um, I think those all it, it, that that I guess people call that intellectual humility. But I guess I'm also calling it cultural humility, understanding that maybe you're just because you're coming from a culture that perhaps is more successful, more affluent, whatever have you, does not mean that your your culture is better. It's just different. There's different nuances that are at play. And what I find with the culture in my school, for instance, is that they're very happy with the culture that they have. Super, super proud of their culture. And it's important to respect that um, and help folks along as much as you can. Yeah. Well, and, you know, you all live in an amazing part of the world that has been, you know, has, has created so much, um, you know, art and science and political contributions and things like that. It's a, it's an amazing place to be from. Um, one thing that I'm just taking away from this conversation is, you know, part of what I'm hearing you say is, or, or, or what I feel like I'm hearing in your descriptions is how much value you place on everyone in that school building, that you're sort of looking around and being like, Every single person here is a resource. You know, I'm a resource. My fellow teachers are resources, the paraprofessionals, the special ed teachers, my students, my students who are the, you know, who would be shown by tests to be the strongest mathematical students, the students who wouldn't be shown by tests to be the strongest mathematical students. Like each person in this building is a resource that we can be pulling on to create, you know, a school community, which is both academically rich and vibrant, but also nurturing to us as people and, and, uh, um, and as a community, that seems like something really powerful to, um, to take away from our conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Every single body, regardless of how much value we believe as a, or a society places on them, they all end up being an integral part of what a community looks like. So, that's beautiful. Well, Jose Wilson, thanks so much for spending some time talking with us at the end of a long and hard day. Um, it's a real privilege to get to hear some of these nuggets right from your classroom. Um, and uh, I wish you the best of luck in the year ahead. Appreciate it, sir. Talk to you soon.